Hello and welcome to the Talent Tide podcast, the show that ensures you have the information you need to adapt and evolve your workplace culture as you ride the wave of change in talent management. I'm your host, Chris Nichols, and today we're going to talk about how to find your winning edge with Greg Taylor. We'll discuss the ins and outs of his Take Another Step system and offer listeners a special surprise at the end. Be sure to listen all the way through for the details. Greg is a proven business leader with a long history of selecting, coaching, and developing people to be strong team players and leaders. His proven expertise is focused on creating results-oriented cultures by efficiently implementing effective systems and processes that enable individuals, teams, and organizations to reach the next level. Greg's deepest desire is to inspire others to take another step necessary to enrich and transform their lives professionally, personally, and spiritually. He applies these same principles to the people in his life that include his wife, Mickey, of 32 years, two sons, and three grandchildren. Greg also manages his young, youngest son's career as a wide receiver for the San Francisco 49ers. And Greg is also a personal friend of mine, so I'm excited to have him on the podcast today. Greg, thanks again for being on the podcast today. Uh, we've, we've known each other now for, for several years, and we've had a wide range of, of conversation about leadership and, and how to grow businesses, how to grow personally, how to grow professionally. But uh, why don't you give our listeners a little bit of background on your career and how you got into the role that you have today? Okay. Well, first of all, I want to tell you how, much, how honored I am to be here today. So thank you for your time. And we're going to have a great discussion today about leadership and how to, how we take another step and how we get other pe- people to take another step. But how did I get here today? I drove here today. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm a re- I was actually born in a coal mining camp in southeastern Kentucky. My grandparents were coal miners. My dad was a coal miner, then became a, a coach, a football, high school football coach, a teacher, then became a principal. I played high school football, played college football at Western Kentucky University, got a degree in finance. And so I was, I had the old dumb jock syndrome. So I made a 1.2 one semester in college. And uh, my dad and I had a long conversation about that. But, uh, but I knew I had to change because I, my dream was to play in the NFL. So I'm in my fourth year of college and that's not going to work for me. So I've met my, my wife of 33 years now. I met her. So my value system changed. So I went from making a 1.2, make a long story short, I made the dean's list my last semester there. So it doesn't matter where you're at. Okay, I'm a 1.2. I think I'm a dumb jock, but I can transform that. But I got to look in the mirror and go, hey, you're the problem. You're the problem because you don't think you can learn. Because once I could say I can learn, because that's my special sauce for transportation, I can learn. When I read my first book at age 23, and I've read over 200 books, like I can learn. <laughs> It's like the lights came on. And when you, when you actually step out of fear into that, what I can do, because my brain's been built for growth, so i got to use my brain. God's given us the most powerful thing in the universe, and it's our brain. And once I tapped into that, I made the dean's list. I've read, I'm reading books. I can learn. And that just propelled me forward in my career. So I worked at Avid Express for eight years in leadership training, became their director of pricing billing, owned my own trucking company for eight years, moved to Shreveport, Louisiana, and worked for like three different entrepreneurs. And I made it back to Nashville through a friend of mine bought three IC distributors, uh, one in Atlanta, one in Montgomery, and one in Nashville. So I came back here. I ran those three businesses for them. So we got it up to where it, we could sell it at a good EBITDA percentage, and, and now I started my leadership coaching business. Because reading a book, Halftime, I found my purpose in life. And I always knew it, but I was trying to be an entrepreneur. But I'm not an entrepreneur. I'm a coach. I'm the wingman. I'm someone who supports the entrepreneur. Because I, I love people. I tell them when they hire me at, at, in my leadership coaching service, hey, I'm just on your staff. You picked up a 33-year veteran on your staff. Use me to do that. Because I know I can take another step. We just got to figure out how we can get your staff to take another step, and it's tapping into their heart and their spirit. It's not giving them rules, not giving them books to read. We got to figure out who they are, why they are, why they are. Let's help them connect with their inner spirit into their heart, because the heart says, "Does anybody care about me?" Let's do that for them. Let's fill that need. Then we go. Let's connect them to something bigger than what they are, because I know when I worked at Avery Express, I would run through a wall for those people. 
I mean, they're just an amazing people because they touched me to say, hey, I care about you through building relationships of trust. Then they said, hey, there's, we're, I'm going to connect you to something bigger than here. They had mission statements, uh, vision statements, and core values, and this is why we're here every day. I bought into that. So they flipped the dumb jock into a businessman. So it took a lot of lipstick and makeup to cover all that up. So <laughs> <laughs> I love I love that story, Greg. Um, I, I guess I think mostly because I come from a similar background. I understand a lot of what you're saying. Uh, one of the questions I have, though, is you, you talk about your time at Averett Express at the beginning of your career, and you talk about the fact that they have a mission statement, they had a vision statement, they had core values. Every company out there today has those three things, but how they implement and utilize those are differently. And I feel like that what that is what defines an organization from being average or great. So what made Averett great, in your opinion, about implementing their mission, vision, and core values into you? What did they do different, in your opinion, that you've seen um, across your career, maybe that you've seen other companies not do as well? Well, they did more than tell you, they showed you. And they showed you how they, they always talk about talk the talk and walk the walk. Because you can say whatever you want your culture to be, but how do you treat people every day is going to determine what your culture is. And that was a culture where it was uplifting. I mean, if you made a mistake, why did you do that? They didn't call me a bunch of names or say you can't do that. No, why did you do that? They let me do a little insight discovery and said, putting fear in me, why did you do that? And they corrected little steps. Well, okay, I see what you did wrong. S insert that, mark that out, insert that into that process there, and that'll work. You agree? Oh, yeah, I see that. Now I got it. So when there's a mistake made, there wasn't fear that came over you to try to lie to them and tell them to co try to cover up what was wrong. I was very bold to go, here's what I did wrong. I knew they were going to correct me. That is liberating. And if you every time you if you're afraid to make a mistake, you're not you'll never be as good as you can be. It's not going to happen. So it's not what you say you're going to do. It's what you do every day. It sets a culture because you've got a culture. You may you you may say it's this, but go ask your people what it is if you really want to know. I love that answer. Um, you know, if you're afraid to make a mistake, it is so challenging to to move forward. So with with that being said. You talk a lot about being on, on the end of the spectrum that you had to tone it down a bit, right? Like you were always going so hard. Sort of like I should be toning it down now, are you telling me? <laughs> <laughs> no, I love your energy, Greg. Um, I, I, can, I can keep up with your energy. but Yeah, you've got the same level of energy. Uh, uh, absolutely. And so what I find personally and professionally is that I have to make that adjustment to others. I have to come down from my energy level sometimes mm. to meet them where they're at. So you mentioned in your career how important it was for you to understand that people are different than you. Can you talk about what that realization was like and how you came to that realization? <laughs> Can I t I'm afraid to tell you how long it took me to figure, <laughs> took me to figure that out. So I was probably, mm, in my really, my transformation from a volcano to a missile was probably in my 37 to 42 years old when I really said, everybody's not like me. And I've had people tell me that my whole life. The people, these, they're not like you, Greg. They haven't been through what you do. They don't have your personality. They don't have your experiences. Because my mentor would say, you gotta figure out who they are. Don't worry about who you are. Maybe that was my problem. I didn't know who I was. Until I took a step back and said, who am I? What's my personality type? What's my family, childhood, educational experience? And what are my significant emotional experiences in life? Because I go, well, who am I? Then now, now that I know who I am, then I'm comfortable with who I am, honestly, because it takes some real tough questions to ask people. Tell me what you think about me, and they feel free to tell you the truth. It made me cry a couple times. I'm going to get into that story. But doing some leadership survey, they, they blew me out of the water. They were, they were fearful. I can't do that. I'm here to help them take another step. I'm here to inspire them to do something great. I'm not here to scare somebody. But... That made me go, wow, well, I can't do that. What My mentor, he's been telling me that for eight years. You can't have this much energy. You can't do this. He said, I love you, but you can't do what you're doing right now. It doesn't work. So you were that leader that made your employees uncomfortable to make a mistake. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? 
I, I was probably no. I was I was I was okay with that. I didn't listen. Demanding. I mean, if they came back with something, I couldn't handle a negative tone. I mean, I'd freak out about a negative tone. If someone said they can't do something, I would just. I mean, the volcano would go off. <laughs> or they would tell me that I couldn't do something, the volcano would go off. Because you could do anything, right? I can do anything. Just give me the ball. <laughs> what do you mean? I can, I can do that. I can do that. It's like my dad said. If you got a problem, ask Greg. He can solve it for you. <laughs> because he said I got an answer for everything. He said, I don't know what he's talking about, it, but it sounds good. <laughs> but, yeah, it's just toning it down. I had to learn. I had to go meet people where they are. And, and I learned that by watching my mentors around me. They met me where I was. They didn't stand over here and say, Greg, get calmed down. Oh, they walked down there with me and go, what, what are you doing? <laughs> and they got, they got intimate with who I am. They gave me a sense of care and concern, and they led me out to become a better person than I currently was. The leadership did that. Not me, the leadership. A leader is a person who inspires another to take a journey that they're not going to take by themselves. I probably wouldn't have found who I am without a lot of leadership in my life. People inspired me to take another step. People inspired me to look within myself. People inspired me to look at other people. Now, how can I help them to take another step? So you talk there about mentorship, leadership, which is a constant conversation in today's workplace. Do you have a formal mentorship program? Is it informal? How do I find a mentor? How do I know if I'm a leader? So I'd, I'd like to transition to, to that topic, if you don't mind, Greg. And so, this, hey, this is your show, Coach. Well, <laughs> but I'm, if you I'm, give me much room, I'll take over, but I won't do that. <laughs> I, I appreciate you letting me stay in the driver's seat. <laughs> so mentorship, those mentors that you had, were those mentors that were given to you and said, hey, you need to go mentor Greg? Or were they people that you gravitated towards and you call them a mentor now looking back on it. What was that relationship like? How did those form? Man, at that point in time, I didn't, I didn't know what I was doing. I'm just saying I knew how much money I wanted to make. I knew I wanted to be an executive in business. I didn't have a, I didn't have a clue what to do. And these people just embraced me. And they, they, they showed me the good about me. They showed me the bad about me. And they did that in an encouraging way. They didn't do it in a belittling way. Then I found who I was. Then, then I left them. <laughs> they gave me so much confidence that, which is a little bit of an arrogant part, that's when I went and started my own company. I can do this by myself. Well, that, well that's another journey. So what was your question on get back to the point? So I, how, how, did you, how did you secure a mentor? Like You said looking back on it, you didn't know if it was formal or not. I, I don't know. I, wow, that's a good question. How did I do that? I just knew that I was going to do something, and I knew I had people. I needed people to help me because playing football, my coaches inspired me. I mean, I remember walking out of locker rooms playing football like my feet weren't on the ground. And probably the most liberating thing, my high school football coach, we won a state championship in high school. He said, if you want to be a champion, and I wanted to be a champion, being that type A personality, fighting anybody and everybody to win. I got to win at all costs. If you want to be a champion, when you come back in here after the game, go look in the mirror and ask yourself a question. Did I do everything that I could possibly do on every single play to help my team win? If you can say, yes, you're a champion, don't worry about the score. You let me worry about the score. He taught me a leadership lesson. Leadership rises and falls on him. Coach Bear Bryant, the greatest college football coach ever, maybe him and Nick are battling out with each other. But he said, look, when we lose, I take responsibility for it. When we win, I give all the credit away. And I heard that when I was, I was 12, 13 years old. I mean, that's like, that's stuck with me ever since then. Because the people that inspire me to take another step are the ones that are willing to stand up and say, hey, Greg, I got your back. Go make a play. Don't be afraid. I got your back. Go by my rules. If you change it, come back and tell me, but go make a play. I trust you that you can do this. I love that, uh, the comment you made about, about your coaches setting that standard for you because I, I had a similar situation um, growing up myself and um, growing up playing sports as well. My dad always said to me, you, you, when you leave that floor tonight, you won't know it, but... I want you to make sure that when somebody leaves the gym or the, the baseball field, that they remember your number, that they, that they tell somebody else about watching you play. 
They may not know your name, but they remember who you were out there because you made an impact. And that doesn't mean that you made an impact in the stat sheet, but they they saw you. That's right. And that's good. That's so good. It it, it remains with me today. That's and good. he probably doesn't even know how strong of a of a quote that was for me. He would always tell me that over and over again, but it stays with me today, even in the workplace, right? Um, and, and for me, it's how do I how do I make sure that I make an impact on anybody that I come mm-hmm. across every day? Like I want it to be positive, right? right? Uh, See, you, you, he put that into you. That's a legacy put in because a legacy is not a legacy is not something you we give to people. It's something we put into them, meaning by how the way we talk to how we make them feel, what they see us do, what they know about us, because that goes into their unconscious mind, which is where eighty five percent of your of your behavior comes from. So you just do that because he put it into you. Just over and over and over. Because repetition, re, I'm sorry, repetition is your best friend. Doing the same thing over and over and over. Hearing the same thing over and over and over and over. You're going to get it at some point. It's sort of like when I was 23 years old and I came home one day and I was talking to my mom and I was actually talking like I had some sense. And she started crying. I said, Mom, what are you crying about? You're talking like you got some sense. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, I don't know if I'm... I'm just t- do, probably doing what you told me to do. He said, well, you never did listen to me. I said, well, apparently my unconscious mind, it was listening to you. So. <laughs> well, I, I love this. I love the conversation here about how to take another step, how to, how to move forward in your career. But can you talk a little bit about what you're doing today? Um, I, I guess, first and foremost, you, you are an executive coach now. You're a leadership coach. You're doing these types of things to help other people. But how did you find your winning edge? How did you get, how did you get here today? How did you end up in this room with me today um, to talk about how to move companies forward, how to move people forward, how to move yourself forward spiritually, personally, et cetera? When you were answering, I was trying to formulate a question. One thing popped into my head. Really, it's probably my... My special sauce is probably winning through adversity. Just, okay, you failed, so what, now what? Okay, you got beat, so what, now what? I, I just, relentless, just, you got to win. You got to win through adversity. Okay, you, you, you lost yesterday, so what? My business failed, so what? That really happened to me, my business failed, so what? What am I going to do? Now, it took me a while to get, that was a process I went through to get over that, but I got over that. And my mom and dad would say, listen, Greg, when you, when you fail, learn something from it. So make sure you don't do that again. Because in my business fair, I wrote down eight things that I learned. Because I read those things to someone that's just starting a business, one of my clients is starting their own business. And I was struggling, golly, do I say this? Because that's kind of like a negative tone. But no, I want to inspire someone. Hey, don't learn what I learned the hard way. Learn it before you start. So I read those. We talked about those eight things that I learned. And the biggest one was listen to other people. Take advice. People are smarter than you. Get the right people on your bus. Let them help you. Because I didn't want anybody to help me. I'm big, bad Greg Taylor. I don't need anybody to help me. Well, that's not good. It's good in a sense, but it's not good in another sense. That's why one of my, in my take another step system in leadership philosophy is leadership is situational. I mean, that takes, that takes a lot of discernment and temperament to walk through all those different scenarios. And, and if you haven't been there before, you probably need to ask somebody that's been there before. Yeah, you, you bring up a couple of things there, that, that piece of adversity, right? Like you talked about it through the eyes of, of winning and, and it comes across from a sports perspective. But if we, if we circle it back to business and we think about the terminology for those of, for those of our listeners that um, aren't the sports fans that you and I are, it's, it's losing a client, right? It's understanding what happens when you lose that client and, and what you're, how you respond to losing that client, right? Because there's a positive way that you can respond and there's a negative way. And the positive way is to say, is start asking the questions. That's good. What led us down the path to lose this client? It wasn't. It wasn't one thing. It never is. That's right. It's it's an escalation of of different items. Um, it's it's never going to be about cost. Cost might be in that group, but at the end of the day, the relationship at some point was fractured. So, when when you go through that adversity, 
Greg, can you talk about the steps to, to take to evaluate and analyze a loss and what you do on the back end of that? Yeah, no, no, that's a good question. Hey, look, what you're doing, right, I call it hindsight's 2020, but every, everybody's got to be okay with hindsight 2020. You got to be able to look at the bold, hard facts in an ugly manner. Let's look at the ugly. Let's put ugly on the table. A lot of people don't want to do that. They can't grow. Sometimes we got to do a, like a, like a, what do you call it? Pruning. You got to prune trees. You got to prune some things. Is it essential or is it not essential? I mean, that's big verbiage in today's world. We got to figure out what's essential and what's not essential. We lost that customer. What, what did that customer, what were their needs? What, what did they like? What did they dislike? What, who's, who's our competition? Do we really understand our customer? Well, let's go talk to them, coach. <laughs> let's go have a conversation. What about, it? let's quit the email, stop the texting. Let's go have a conversation with them. Can you give me feedback here? Because I don't want to make this same mistake again. So I'm going to embrace the failure, step one. And I've got to embrace it, say this happened for me, not to me. Because in my business failure, probably five or six, seven, eight months it took me to go over it. One day I just crawled under my desk and I cried for 30 minutes. Because once again, I don't get beat. Well, you got your butt handed to you, Greg. So I just curled up in a little ball and cried and got it out. Then I walked out of there going, okay, I did it. It's my fault. Now, what are you going to learn? I had to buy that thing. I could blame people or I can go through the rest of my life being miserable. That day, for 30 minutes, I let all that ang anger out and all that frustration out of me. Now, I can put something good in me. Because you got to get ugly out of you. <laughs> that was ugly. Okay, now what am I going to learn from that? That's when I wrote those eight things. And it took me probably two years to write those eight things. It's just not, it's not a light switch. We're humans. We have emotions. You don't turn this on and off. Golly, that sounded like my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Which my wife's an incredible lady, so <laughs> she's been put up with a volcano. Sometimes he turns into a missile, but but anyway, yeah, you got to embrace it. You got to learn from it, and you just got to take another step. You got to get out of the bed, and you got to go at it again. You got to pick up where you left off. You got to learn from. It. So you got to you got to did this happen for me or to me? And the greatest thing a guy used to tell me said, "Greg, you're the author of your book. You got the pen." What do you want the ending to look like? You're in charge. Not the circumstances, not the economy, not COVID, not my boss, not my wife, not my kids, not my parents, not my bad circumstances in my life. I'm in charge of my book. I'm the author of my book, and I'm going to write the ending. And I'm in charge of that. That gives me peace. Because we all deal with adversity every day. But I've got the pen to my book. I get to write how that bad thing helps me not hurts me i love that embrace the failure uh i think that is something that we can all do so much better uh professionally and personally right we we have to be able to see the negative we have to see the ugly like you talk about and uh, until we can do that ourselves and 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 think about critically about how we impacted the result then it's going to be really hard for us to move forward That's right. so yeah, my mama says, if you, until you own it, you can't fix it. So my mama and I, she whipped me a lot. And I would always blame people and deflect and do all that stuff. Well, this and that. No, you, it, this is your behavior. Own the behavior. I love you. You're a great person. I'm trying to change your behavior. My mom taught me how to take the person's good, the behavior's bad, and separate those two. They're not the same. Because when you discipline people, I love you, I hate your behavior. I don't hate you, I hate your behavior. You're a good person. So how do we change your behavior? Well, I gotta have a relationship with them and I gotta get them positive and negative consequences that are immediate and they're certain. That's how you change behavior. So that's probably the greatest thing that she taught me right there. Because when my business failed, I went, hmm, Okay, that's a consequence. That doesn't make me who I am. I just went through that. So I can take 50-20 vision, everything that's good, bad, and ugly, and I can use it and I can catapult my career into what I want it to be because I got the pen and I'm about to write the end of the story. Circling way back to the front, you mentioned how you realized that you're not 
an entrepreneur like you thought maybe you were that you like being a part of the, the, the process but not being at the at the top of the process maybe I misheard you but do you- yeah an entrepreneur and I we think differently entrepreneur they're always thinking about how to make money you say that's a different process I'm, I'm a systems people processes and people developer and leader developer that's what I think it's always thought about because one of my reasons I failed a business making money wasn't my number one goal my number one goal was to create the greatest place to work. That's not, that's not <laughs> entrepreneurial thinking. The entrepreneurial's got to think about making money because if you don't make money, you can't help anybody. I love people, but if, if I would have been focused on making money, I could help people. You, if you can't help people, you don't have the resources to help them. See, that's what everybody in America, we're getting confused. We've got to have money. We've got to have resources. And everybody's got to go earn your keep. It's okay to to make whatever money you're making, just be content with it and strive to take another step that you're on that journey because there's where happiness and peace exists when you're on that journey and you know you're taking another step and you know that you're not where you're not where you're going to be, but you're not where you used to be. And when you look up and you can look at that and you go, damn, look at all the steps I took, coach. Because if you take one step a day, that's 365 a year. Then after 20 years, I don't know how much that is, about 8,000. <laughs> That's 8,000 steps. Right. That, because if you're focused, you're committed, and you're consistent, and you're intentional with what you're doing, and you've got to reward yourself every day with taking another step. Because it's not glamorous to take one step. You don't get your picture in the paper. You don't get it on social media. It's, it's called work. It's called grind. It's called do things that other people are not willing to do. I, I think this is a great merger of the, the thoughts that we have around this podcast. Um, when we talk about the, the workforce today, managing talent, companies have to have equal parts of a mindset of, of how we're going to generate revenue and how we're going to do that. And generating revenue is a mathematical formula. How you do that is based upon the people that you hire and the processes that you put in place. And there's so many organizations that, that we come across that have bad processes, bad systems. They, they know how they're supposed to make money, but the problem is that the processes and systems that they have in place are fractured. Right. So as a, as a leader, whether it's a, a manager, director, VP level, even, even C-level, you have to be able to influence others. So can you can you talk a little bit about influence and, and building um, a sphere of influence in the workplace? Oh, yeah. I'd, I'll give everybody two books to read that I had to read because connecting with people, my mom and dad taught me a lot of great things, but connecting with people, they didn't teach me that. And networking, so I had to learn those things because everything, you can learn anything. And uh, which I used to sit and just watch my mentor at Avert Express, watch how he greeted everybody walking in. So guess what I did, coach? I don't know what to do. I'm just going to do what he does. Because <laughs> I read a book. It's called Your Winner's Winning Edge by Dennis Waitley. And it said, if you want to be like somebody, go do what they do. Wear what they wear. Read the books that they're reading. Talk the way they talk. Walk the way you walk. So I just started walking around looking at these executive offices. I'd see a book. I'd go get that book and read it. It had a magazine, I'd get that magazine. I'd read them and go, I ain't got a clue what that is. <laughs> but that's okay. But I knew in my mind, I'm training my mind, and I know I'm going to get there. I just got to go through the process to get there. See, a lot of people are not willing to sit back and count the cost. I asked my son, one day he plays for the 49ers, he's in his fourth year, he, his sophomore year, going back to La Tech, you're place that you worked, that's where we met. I said, you ever thought about playing in the pros? He said, well, I think that's what everybody does if you're in college next day. I said, no, have you really thought about it? Have you really, are you willing to engage in that? I said, I went and saw him training at a, at a place here in Nashville, and I said, you, you, you're a little different. You got some different skill sets. Have you ever thought about doing it? He's like, yeah, but are you willing to work for it? I said, for the next three years, before you answer, yes, I want to, are you willing to work harder than everybody else? Are you willing to give up some friends? Are you willing to give up some fun? Are you willing to give with your coach after practice and let him critique you? And you work on every step, stop every wasted motion that you got. You got to work harder than everybody else. Then you got three years to do this. And you got a half of a half of a half percent of chance of making it. This, there's no guarantee in life. 
I said, but, it, but if you don't make it, it doesn't matter. <laughs> You're my son. I'm your dad. Let's move on with life. But look at everything that you learned on that journey. Now what can you do with that? All the doors are open for you because you can handle them. You can handle responsibility. Then if you do make it, well, Lord have mercy. Nobody really cares either. Me and you do. That's okay. We'll take advantage of it. Let's move on. Let's take another step. Okay, you made it to the NFL. So what now? Well, you can, now you got to take another step. Those guys get cut every day. Probably 25 guys got cut this week. Oh, I thought they had a contract. There's no contract. What have you done for me lately? You got to wake up with a mindset every day. I'm taking another step today. You can put fear on that, or you can put, "Hey, I'm just in life. I'm going to be the very best version of myself." That's my stress point. I don't, am I good enough? I don't care. Am I working hard enough? I can control that. Okay, I can control being nice to you, Mr. Cree. Even though I don't want to, I can still control that. I, I'm in control. Then my oldest son, he told me one day, he said, "Dad, I figured out the most powerful thing I have. It's the freedom of choice." I said, "Tell me about that." He said, my choices got me to where I am, and my choices will get me out of where I am. Where I want to go is based on my choices. I was like, I started crying. <laughs> I was like, who's that? I mean, I was like, wow. He got it. He's got it. He gets to choose his path. Does that mean there'll be potholes and rain and floods? Yeah, bad things are going to happen. But it's okay. You get to choose to do what happened after that. Nobody's dictating to you what you have to do. You get to choose what to do. That's what makes this country great. It's November 4th, uh, 2020. So we are one day uh, removed from our election. And you, you talked earlier about how, uh, you know, we, we can't allow external circumstances to define who we are. And uh, what a, 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 a day for that, right? I mean... Here we are. We're one day past uh, election day, like I said, and and we we don't know who our president's going to be. But at the end of the day, it it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter, right? It, it doesn't matter. Our choice. We we live in a great country where we have a choice. In in many instances, how we respond to the negativity in our lives, and um, I, I think at this point, it's it's great to talk about. Um, Let's transition to how does someone go about finding their own winning edge? You talk about how you've done it. You did it because you realized what your goals in life were. What if I don't? What if I don't know what my goals are? What if? What if I'm sitting here and I've been in this same job for the last eight years and I'm comfortable, but I'd like to take the next step, but I don't know how to. How does how does somebody go find their winning edge? Well, the. The first thing that came into my mind is you got to find a good coach or a mentor. You can't do it by yourself. I mean, you can read all these self-help books that you want to read, which is good. I've read a bunch of them because once I learn I can read and I can comprehend what I'm reading, then I can do what I'm learning, that I'm getting what I want from what I'm learning, I think I'll read another book. <laughs> so the first thing I would do, leaders are readers. I read my first book at 23, Coach. I didn't read a lot of books. <laughs> I didn't think I could. I don't know if I got ADHD or not, but I got all the symptoms of it. I mean, I just couldn't do it. But it has so much value to me now. It motivates me to read because of what I get for it. That's the consequence. I have pain. I have short-term pain of reading and staying focused, but my long-term is a gain for me. I get motivated about that long-term gain because I can help people the more information I got, the more experience I got, the more stories I got, the more powerful I become in helping people, help them take another step. That motivates me. So that motivates me through the pain to get to where I'm trying to get to because you got to figure out what, where you want to go. But, yeah, get a coach a mentor, your leader at work, or an HR person at work, get someone to help you figure out what that is. You have to ask, right? Gotta to, got to have conversation with people. Yeah. If you don't have that conversation, if, if you aren't willing to have the conversation, no one's going to have it for you. They, they might. You might have somebody that, that really sees something in you, but the majority of the time, you're going to have to go get whatever it is that you That's want. I, I'll tell you a story at my first place of work. I worked all the time. And everybody, guess what everybody told me? They're not going to pay you. You're, you're doing all this wasting your time. Okay, I went, hmm. That's not what my mom told me. See, I had great parents. I, I can hear that voice. It doesn't matter what they say. Just stay, just work out work, everybody. Because the only place 
where success comes before work is in the dictionary. <laughs> okay, you're not going to be successful until you work. So I was raised, too, that there's no complaining and there's no excuses. That's not an option. you got to go out and make your own. You have to go out and put forth the F effort to go get what you want and get people to help you. It's, it's amazing. I mean, I can't even think about when I drove out of Western Kentucky with a college degree in finance with emphasis in personal financial planning, Chris, I laughed. I said, what the heck just happened? I didn't come here. I never thought I would graduate from college. That wasn't even my goal. My goal was to play in the NFL. I went to school to play football. I didn't go to school to go to school. <laughs> when I drove out there in my 1984 Chevette looking in the river, I just laughed for like five minutes. What the heck happened? Well, what happened is I went to class. I showed up. I said, I can learn. I read the book. I let people talk to me. I studied with people. I got through the fear of being rejected, and I'm not good enough. And I said, I can do this. Then I just kept making Then I make the dean's list, and my mom and dad go, we've told you all alone you can do this. But until the person looks in the mirror and says, I can, everything else is on hold. The person's got to look in the mirror and go, I can. And it starts with those two words. Don't talk about what we're going to do. Let's talk about what we're going to do. I'm going to do. What are you going to do? Let's talk about it. you got to buy it. you got to own it. It's yours. Take it and run with it. Love it. Love it. So we're, we're getting close to time here. Um, should have we, I ask any of your questions yet or have I just been? We'll let the leaders uh, or we'll <laughs> let the listeners decide um, on, that, uh, on that question, Greg. But... Um, like I said, we're, we're wrapping up here. We're getting close to the end, and it, it's my turn to let you talk. <laughs> Wait, I've let you talk this whole time. But um, if you don't mind, uh, this is your opportunity to talk about the, your, your Take Another Step program. Um, what is that? It, it's an it's a inspirational leadership workshop, and it's the, the premise is a leader is a person. I said this earlier. The premise that I built this off of is a leader is a person who inspires another person to take a journey that they're not going to take by themselves. So it's a, it's a, it's a workshop. It's 10 modules, one hour apiece, and it starts at the beginning. It starts beginning with the end in mind. Who's built negative or positive emotions in you in your life? Let's find out what that is. Let's find out what's in you to be a leader so we can tap into that. Because, because we, I call it flip the script. Because if somebody did something bad to you, now let's use that to make sure you don't do that to somebody else. Let's get conscious to that. Let's write that down. Let's talk about that. Then we're going to write your leadership legacy. Begin with the end in mind. Stephen Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Then we go into core values. Then we go into mindset. Then we move into 10 things that leadership is and leadership is not. Then we move into the four mindsets that we need, which is to be our best, seize the day, make a play, and I'm a champion. And this is all about getting people to want to do great things because they want to, not because the management wants them to. See the flip? We can tell them to do all this stuff until they're inspired to do it, they're probably not going to do it. And it, to me, and it all starts with a relationship. Leaders would come to me when I was developing leaders in corporations. I can't get him to do anything. I said, what's his wife's name? What's that got to do? Got everything to do with it. What's his dog's name? Do you know Johnny played a baseball game last night? And they would go, how do you know that? I, I know him. you got to get to know how many times if I talk. you got to get to know these people. They, they know you don't care because you don't know them. Well, they'll do stuff for you because, yeah, I asked him about Johnny's ball game and he walked by my office. How'd Johnny do last night? How about come out of your desk and come off your high horse and walk with your people and get to know them, get to know their experiences? What, what are they like? What are they not like? Because if you give of yourself, nature tells us they're going to give of their self more. But if you don't give of yourself, they're not going to do anything. Hate to say that, but that's, that's just that's human behavior. We're, we're emotional creatures. I'm the biggest emotional people, biggest emotional person that, that there is. 
So I always said I wasn't emotional. <laughs> that's called, that's calling the cattle. What's that? What's that story? Anyway, that's the cattle calling the whatever. I can't say it. <laughs> Pot calling the kettle black. There you go, Chris. Thank you. See, you, see, my older brother used to talk for me. So thank you, <laughs> Greg. This has been great today. Um, I'm going to have to have you back on because there's there's so many different topics that we didn't get to today that. Um, I'd, I'd love to talk with you about in the future. Um, but before we wrap up, why don't you tell the listeners what, what that special offering is that I mentioned at the beginning of, our, of the podcast today. Yeah, how you connect with me, you can go to my website, uh, www.findyourwinningedge.com, and uh, I'll give you a free consultation, coaching consultation, to, so you can engage with that service to see if you like that or not. And I uh, also do professional speaking services, focusing on leadership and transformation. Then I have my 10-module uh, Take Another Step system, an inspirational leadership workshop. So there's also a new service that I'm providing. It's called The Lion's Den, A Leader's Journey. Because if you're a leader, we're all sitting in the lion's den every day. <laughs> and all these lines list the things to do, and all these priorities are looking at us every day. And, and how do you survive in that lion's den? And how do you prosper? in that lion's den. So you can go on my webpage and sign up for that webinar. It's the third Thursday of each month and sign up for that and come and join us with that. And give me a call. My phone number is 318-230-6481. And that is findyourwinningedge.com. Bingo. Thank you for joining us today. And please remember to subscribe and share our podcast with fellow leaders. You can find us on Spotify, Apple, Google Podcast or anywhere else that you get your podcast. Thanks again for joining us and we look forward to the next podcast.